Hello, and welcome to Bladder Cancer and COVID-19. We're here talking about regional updates for patients on what they need to know. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Please remember that attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have a question for any of our presenters, please use the little question box at the bottom of your screen, type in your questions when you think of them, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of today's program. Okay. I would like to introduce you all to our wonderful panel of speakers. We have urologist Dr. Cheryl Lee from The Ohio State University. Welcome, Cheryl. We have medical oncologist, Dr. Peter O'Donnell from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Peter. And radiation oncologist, Omar Main from the Cleveland Clinic. And then we have community urologist, Jason Haffron, who is here representing the Michigan Institute of Urology. Welcome to all of you. We're so delighted to have you here. So with that, I'd like to open it up and really kind of kick off this conversation with the idea that everyone is really used to hearing about social distancing. And some people are experiencing what we're calling medical distancing, where perhaps they're getting a call from their doctor's office or they're due to schedule an appointment and they're finding out that their practice is not letting them schedule appointments right now until this COVID-19 pandemic dies down a little bit. And that's the concept of medical distancing. So with that in mind, I'm going to open it up with Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind. Could you just talk a little bit about what might be going on at your institution in medical distancing? How are protocols changing at the hospitals and then, of course, in the doctor's offices to help protect not only the patients and their families, but also the staff? What's going on in the Ohio State University hospital system? Well, thank you for that question. It's a very important one, Stephanie. I'd like to welcome all of the uh, participants in the webinar today. This is a really uh, important issue to consider that is the medical distancing. Uh, and I'll start by saying uh, at the Ohio State University and as other centers around the country, our primary uh, goal is to keep our patients safe, keep our healthcare workers safe, uh, and at the same time prepare for a large influx of patients affected by this very difficult uh, infectious disease, the COVID-19. Um, what uh, I think what patients should also know is that many uh, healthcare systems around the country uh, were not necessarily prepared for very large influxes of patients with this disease that sometimes requires an ICU stay uh, and uh, a ventilator to support breathing. Uh, in order to prepare for some of these patients, we've had to relax our uh, normal work ethic, our, our normal work efforts in the clinic and in the operating room. What that has meant is that uh, for more elective problems, we are actually postponing uh, evaluations, surveillance, and even treatment, just so uh, our hospital can be prepared for these very sick patients coming in. Another uh, important issue that uh, hospitals are, are facing, uh, and the Ohio State University has also faced this, is having enough uh, equipment and gear, meaning gowns, gloves, masks, so that the people who are on the front line taking care of these sick uh, COVID patients in the emergency room or in the ICU or even on the floors have the right protection uh, so that they continue to stay healthy and they can continue to take care of patients. So as we try to preserve this kind of equipment for uh, these frontline healthcare workers, and these are doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, uh, medical technicians, uh, EM, EMTs, everything, uh, everyone. But as we try to uh, preserve the gear and the equipment needed for these people, that means we can't use it for other things we normally would like procedures in the clinic and procedures in the operating room. So because of this, we are deferring some, tr some treatments. Uh, also, as a way to uh, protect our patients and our healthcare workers, we're trying to reduce exposures. And herein, I think, is where patients really are impacted by this medical distancing. Uh, to reduce exposures, 
we are leveraging technology with telehealth, either phone visits or video visits, uh, to try to communicate with our patients, to survey our patients, and to understand what needs they have. Sometimes we're postponing uh, problems that can wait a month or two. Uh, so uh, when a patient is called and, and their appointment is canceled or delayed, this is part of that reason is to not only uh, reduce uh, some of the uh, exposure of the healthcare workers, but also to reduce the exposure of the patient. Uh, because uh, as we think about our population of patients that uh, primarily get bladder cancer, we're talking about individuals over age 65 generally and this is a group of patients, particularly those who have other conditions like hypertension, diabetes, uh, or, or obesity, uh, or again, advanced age, that these patients, if they uh, get COVID-19, they may have a much more aggressive course with it. So, uh, so that's a, a long um, answer to say uh, that when we medically distance our patients, it's not because we're not still committed to their uh, treatments and their care and their surveillance, but we're trying to protect them. We're trying to protect healthcare workers, and we're really trying to make sure we can care for these very ill patients with COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Dr. Main, are you seeing anything in your institution as far as um, you know delays in getting patients in for chemo or immunotherapies or anything else because you're working in the medical oncology space? Oh, yeah, no, I'm so, sorry. Dr. Main is talking in radiation oncology. I'm so sorry about that. I met Dr. O'Donnell, but go ahead, Dr. Main. Let's talk about radiation oncology because I think that there's some interesting stuff there. And then we'll get to Dr. O'Donnell. I'm sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. Let me also just say thank you, Stephanie, so much for organizing this. This is a, a great resource for patients, and uh, BCAN is always um, kind of out there in front in this way, and I think that's great. So and thank you also for inviting me and to all the participants who are here with us today. Um, you know, I would just echo some of the things that uh, Dr. Lee just said. We're also trying to navigate this, um, you know, quickly changing medical distancing um, era that we're in. And, you know, the trick here is to not let our patients feel distant from us, even though we have to um, kind of change the way we're doing things day to day. So, you know, a couple of the things I just say for the patients that do come in, one of the things they'll notice is quite different. You know, this um, backdrop that you see behind me is our cancer center building, which has a number of entrances, but they're almost all closed except for one or two access points to that building at which there's nurses and healthcare workers stationed. And so everyone who comes in, including the healthcare workers, has a temperature taken. Uh, is asked a few questions by a, a very nice group of uh, providers in terms of um, uh, contacts and symptoms they may be having. And we have this sort of triage in place just right at the door to protect everyone who, who is inside that building. As you might imagine, many of those patients are, uh, are perhaps more vulnerable than the general public um, uh, to, uh, to the virus. So that's, that's one thing. Another uh, thing we've done to try to kind of um, approach this medical distancing is we've moved a lot of our visits to virtual visits. We're all becoming sort of rapid experts at telehealth. And um, that's certainly been the case with my practice um, for patients who don't need an urgent visit. You know, we still have in-person clinics, but for the most part, my follow-up clinic, those patients under surveillance, um, they, I, I, I tend to see them more by virtual visit and, uh, and keep those encounters um, distant in that way. In terms of your question, Stephanie, you know, how are we doing things different? Are we seeing delays in treatment? Uh, what, what, uh, how has the, um, have these precautions impacted care? There are a couple of things, you know, we're, we're noticing our volumes are down for one. Um, we um, are pretty robust clinical trial accrual prior to this has really slowed down quite a bit and we're being you know, it's not that our interventional trials aren't running, it's that uh, we're kind of being a bit more selective about uh, accruing patients who may need extra visits if they're being cared for as part of a clinical trial. Um, and we're prioritizing um, keeping uh, our care workers uh, safe, the caregivers safe, as well as keeping patients safe and minimizing their visits. But other than that, we, we have not stopped treating, we have not 
Um, for those patients who, uh, who need treatment, we're uh, committed to not delaying that care. Uh, we're just trying to do it in the safest way possible. And so we've put in a few extra upfront triage steps for new patients. We will uh, sort of risk stratify them into who needs to be seen when and how, whether that's a virtual visit or an in-person visit. And for our patients and follow-up, it really depends, you know, what symptoms they may be having, how quickly they need to get in to be seen, or are they just there for routine surveillance or routine follow-up visit, the kind of thing that can be um, transitioned to a telehealth visit or can be delayed uh, for some short period of time. But I think we, we're all trying to be mindful of this, um, this idea that uh, delaying care can impact outcomes, and we want to make sure we do that in a very sensible way. Thank you. Great. Dr. O'Donnell, I'm so sorry for that mix up. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening at the University of Chicago and then what you're seeing in general in medical oncology? Sure. It's my pleasure to be here today. And thanks again for Beacon organizing this uh, really important topic. So uh, the point I want to make at the beginning is that, you know, obviously it, all of us are concerned about COVID and, you know, for anybody watching the news, it seems like that's all anybody cares about right now. But, you know, we all still care about the fact that, you know, some of you have bladder cancer and you're dealing with this. And, you know, I think that actually sometimes it almost can be, become where if you're, if you're not talking about COVID, then nothing else is important. And I think, you know, nothing could be farther from the truth here. You know, the fact that, you know, some patients are dealing with bladder cancer right now, it is the most important thing in their life right now. It's more important than COVID to them. And so, I want to acknowledge that, that, you know, all of us in the bladder cancer community are very attuned to that, that a cancer diagnosis, you know, takes trumps everything else. And so um, we all have to take steps to make sure that those patients that are going through the bladder cancer journey are cared for in the safest possible way. And as the other doctors have said, that does mean changing the ways that we are caring for every patient that might have bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we've done at University of Chicago, you know, very similar to what the other institutions have talked about, but I'll talk about some of the other different aspects that we've undertaken. Um, so at our hospital, we're doing it week by week because of things changing, you know, day by day or week by week. Uh, I'll look at, with my nurse, we look at our entire roster of patients for the upcoming week. And what we do is um, we call each of those patients and we have a shared decision-making discussion about whether that visit that was planned needs to happen in person. And for example, if a patient is, is receiving active treatment like chemotherapy or immunotherapy, oftentimes that is an important visit to keep. Um, I think we're gonna talk later in the hour about you know, when can treatments be skipped, but uh, obviously if a patient needs treatment, that, that's gonna be an in-person visit. And so we'll go over and confirm by a phone call a week in advance that the patient wants to keep that visit. You know, for other visits like uh, routine follow-ups where a patient might just be uh, on surveillance and being seen for a routine visit, that's one where obviously we're going to triage that to a video visit or a telehealth visit. And, you know, I found that the patients actually are wanting this. Sometimes before we can even call the patient a week in advance, they're calling us and saying, Doc, you know, I don't feel real comfortable coming to a hospital right now where on the news I see, you know, so many COVID patients at your hospital. So, you know, they're also feeling more comfortable with you know, a virtual or a telehealth visit for some of those routine surveillance type of visits. You know, and then you have the third category of patients where, you know, perhaps they're needing a scan or a procedure or something like that. And then it becomes, you know, do we really need to do that scan right now? Uh, or can we do the labs that maybe you need, you know, via a home draw? We use a lot of home nurses that go out to patients' home and we'll draw labs and then we'll have those laboratories back and we can use those laboratory results along with a telehealth visit. So, we're using creative ways like all these other medical centers are to try to really decide who needs to come to the medical center. And even if you do have to come to the medical center, there's additional steps that are in place to try to protect your safety. So two days before your visit at University of Chicago, you're going to get a call from a nurse who's going to ask you about upper respiratory related symptoms or fever. Uh, and if you you know, name that any of those are positive, then you're going to be triaged to a special floor of the medical center and get tested for the coronavirus before you would actually be seen for your visit. And so uh, there's a screening process in place that enables us to try to have anybody that really makes it into, you know, the cancer care area as having been pre-screened for COVID. Uh, the second thing that we do is 
you know, once you've, you're in our cancer care area, everyone is socially distanced within that area. So all patients are sitting, you know, six feet apart or more in the waiting rooms. All of our patients are wearing masks. All the staff, of course, are wearing masks. And then even in the chemotherapy suite, you know, we're, we're skipping IV infusion chairs so that patients are never right next to another patient. Um, and so these are all just sort of practical steps that we all have to undertake right now. Great, thank you guys so much. And Dr. Hafrin, you're in the community practice. What is going on there that's a little bit different? And remember that you're also in Michigan. So these are four different locations. So what's happening in Michigan in the community practice? Well, I, I don't think we're seeing much difference than what Dr. Lee or Dr. Main or Dr. O'Donnell has described. We're taking very similar uh, precautions in our practice. Um, with that being said, you know, I practice outside of Detroit and we're really at the peak of our COVID uh, uh, infections right now. Um, we've been hit pretty hard in this area, Southeast Michigan. I think we're number three right now behind uh, New York and California. So it's pretty intense. So we're at the highest, you know, we're at red line right now. Our hospitals are being pushed to the extreme. Um, our hospitals have pretty much, our main hospitals pretty much become a COVID hospital. With that being said, we're doing anything and everything to protect our patients and to continue our care. And uh, as has been alluded to with, with um, the other speakers is we've been able to become creative and been able to manage our patient or, or continue to deliver the care. Most 90% of our practice has gone to telehealth. Uh, I think patients appreciate that. Patients don't want to come out and telehealth has been uh, a godsend. Uh, it's been very helpful. Patients appreciate it. And it's very reassuring to talk to patients and reassure patients that they're going to be okay. And we're continuing to monitor them and do what, what's necessary. As far as our office, we are minimizing our offices to patients that only need to be seen, patients that are undergoing active treatment. Um, are the patients we're seeing, we're screening the patients, pre-screening the patients, checking temperatures at the door, separating the patients, everything that has been described before. We're doing anything and everything to protect our patients, but we're not stopping treatment. You know, the patients have bladder cancer, which is a lethal disease, and these patients need to be treated. Personally, I think the hardest part is the patients that require uh, major operations, primarily cystectomy, uh, because the hospital um, now that we're in this peak period, um, the hospital has stopped us from doing cancer operations. Not that we're only allowed to do emergent surgeries. So I think from my perspective, it's been hard talking to my patients, reassuring my patients that we're going to have to delay your procedure because we don't have the resources right now to run full operating rooms. And for me personally, mm -hmm. as a physician and talking with my patients, it's been hard. But today, uh, we've been delayed for two weeks, and today we just got reopened. So the hospital later this week is going to allow us to do surgery again for, for major cancer operations. So even in the throes and the, the density that we've seen in Detroit, it really only delayed us a week or two in our surgery schedules, and we will you know, get these patients to the operating room that they need. Um, we have eliminated all of our elective or non-essential surgeries so that we can really just focus on doing cancer surgery that is time dependent. And even in the hor uh, horribly hit area, we've you know, basically delayed a patient's a couple weeks, which in the long run is probably not gonna make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Wow. And remember, all of this is taking place, this conversation we're having on April 14th. A week from now, two weeks from now, things might be completely different as we are really moving to try to understand this and get a handle on all of these procedures and changes. So I really do appreciate all of this update about what's happening in this area. I think it's very varied and you're all on the same page in terms of protecting the patients. And I think that that's so important. So I'd like to move on to the next question and we can start again with Dr. Lee. You know, when is it okay to have delays in treatment and surveillance? Patients would like that reassurance to know when it would be okay if you don't come in for your next BCG installation or your next cystoscopy. Are there certain times when, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room? Can you talk about that at all? 
Dr. Lee? I want to uh, really underscore uh, a couple of things that were said, but as it relates to this question about when is it okay to delay. One, um, the situation is very different state to state. And what, uh, what one state uh, or an area of institutions may be able uh, to, to do to treat a patient or may have to delay a patient, it may be very different one or two states over. So whatever comments we make today, I wanna to make sure that our audience does know that things are fluid and they are changing. Uh, and certainly all of the speakers here, but all providers taking care of bladder cancer patients want our patients to get treated. But we have to think about risks uh, and benefits. And we know that if we're talking about, uh, you know, from the surgical perspective, uh, earlier stage cancers, we have a lot more leeway in terms of delaying treatments and, uh, uh, and delaying surveillance than we do uh, in patients who are higher risk or higher stage. But let's take the patients who have uh, non-muscle invading bladder cancers. Some of these patients uh, may be in a low risk setting uh, with lower grade disease and low volume tumor. Uh, they actually have a very low risk of, of that disease ever really impacting their life or their survival. Uh, and although the tumors can come back, uh, generally that would not affect their, their long-term survival. So those patients are ones, if they're feeling well, we can delay cystoscopy uh, and the surveillance of the bladder. Uh, we can delay removing tumors that are identified. Uh, and so I think those patients should take some comfort in knowing that those delays are unlikely to have long-term ramifications for them. Now, uh, if we look at the patients with higher risk disease, uh, early invasive cancer with T1 disease or carcinoma in situ, those patients certainly have a risk uh, in those tumors coming back and even uh, progressing over time. But as has been said before, this period that we're in uh, is, is likely uh, going to delay some people, their surveillance and or treatment uh, over a, a matter of several weeks to a few months. Uh, and in that context, again, we shouldn't be seeing major changes uh, in patient survival outcomes over that time frame. So uh, for those patients, if they do miss uh, their cystoscopic surveillance, particularly if they have not had a recurrence of cancer in some time, uh, the delay again is unlikely to have long-term serious ramifications. Now for those patients who are recently diagnosed um, uh, with invasive disease or high-risk disease, uh, if the hospital or the state is in a position where they can still see patients in the ambulatory or clinic space, uh, we are prioritizing those patients to get their BCG and to get their surveillance. So in other words, uh, the longer it's been since you've had a recurrent tumor or an active tumor, the more uh, we feel comfortable perhaps delaying uh, your surveillance by some uh, short period of time until we're out of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So um, uh, I'll also preface the comments for those patients with invasive cancer, but, but still non-muscle invading cancers. Uh, even having a resection of your bladder tumor can be a challenge uh, if hospitals are in a setting where they're only allowed to do life-threatening emergent surgeries. So uh, again, a delay uh, uh, may be required in those centers. We're fortunate right now at Ohio State that we are not in that situation. So we are able to do those procedures. But, but for those who are not, uh, I think as a, a patient is delayed, their status and urgency to have uh, resections or diagnostic procedures or treatments will change over time. And as the conditions change in the hospital, I'm sure providers will be getting back to those patients as quickly as possible. Now, I do wanna just make a comment about cystectomy. Um, uh, I think many of us, uh, nearly all of us in the field would agree that we would consider these essential procedures, particularly for uh, patients with muscle invading cancers. So we have prioritized these surgeries 
Uh, and again, we are fortunate that we're in the situation that we can do those procedures now, but I can tell you that many centers across the country cannot. Uh, so these mm -hmm. procedures that I would say, if at all possible, trying to get these, uh, these surgeries done is, is of the utmost importance. I will say for the patient population, again, that we deal with, they're at higher risk for more aggressive outcomes from COVID-19 if they do acquire it. So again, we want to protect our patients from exposures too, because uh, patients who, even when they're asymptomatic and have the virus, if they have elective surgery, they may have more serious outcomes from the COVID-19 uh, uh, simply going through this process of having elective surgery, especially major elective surgery. So we want to really be careful about who we're operating on. Thank you. Thanks so much. Dr. O'Donnell, you're obviously taking care of patients who have more advanced disease as a medical oncologist. So when is it okay to delay? When is it the kind of thing where, uh, you know, we'll talk next about urgent care, but when is it okay to delay either a follow-up or a treatment? Great question. So the, the situation of metastatic disease is one where we're balancing, right, competing risks, right? We're balancing the risk of how fast that cancer is moving. Does the patient have symptoms right now from their cancer, such as pain, um, versus, you know, the risk that whatever treatment that we're going to start, you know, brings to them from a stand, the standpoint of, you know, having to come to the medical center with usually a good bit of frequency when you're on an active treatment. And so um, at our center, we've made some institutional decisions about that. Uh, for my patients that are receiving chemotherapy, I haven't, uh, I haven't recommended any patients to interrupt or discontinue their chemotherapy. My patients that are typically receiving chemotherapy for metastatic disease are receiving that because their cancer is a, an immediate threat um, to their life. And uh, you could actually argue that that threat to their life uh, is much more, uh, you know, pressing than the theoretical threat of, you know, catching COVID you know, at the medical center. We've already talked about all the steps that all of our medical centers are taking to try to make sure that the environment at the hospital, you know, to receive therapy is as safe as possible. And so with those, you know, precautions put in place, I actually think that, you know, the larger threat to, to my patient's life is not receiving their anti-cancer therapy. So we've chosen to go forward with uh, chemotherapy in all of our patients. Um, immunotherapy is an interesting topic. So I'm talking now about, you know, the, the newer and more modern immunotherapy treatments, not chemotherapy. And in those situations, uh, there's actually pretty convincing data that the immunotherapy drugs stay in a patient's system long enough and have a, a durable effect even when they're, uh, you know, not receiving um, uh, treatments on a regular basis that those immunotherapies are are activating the immune system even in the absence of, of regular infusions of the drug. And so uh, we've counseled our patients to actually uh, skip some of the immunotherapy sessions uh, because of the fact that those drugs stay in the system longer and have durable activity even in the absence of regular infusions. Our policy on immunotherapies has been generally to skip every other session. Uh, because of the, the, the length of time that those drugs usually stay in the bloodstream, uh, it seems safe to uh, skip uh, every other session. And of course, none of us know how long this is going to go on. In an ideal world, we'd like to give those drugs on the FDA-approved schedules that they're supposed to be given on. But we think, um, you know, for during the height of this, as we're in right now, uh, that some patients certainly should be skipped, skipping some of those immunotherapy sessions. And I've done that with almost all of my patients uh, where, and I think the patients are very grateful for that, uh, if we reassure them that the, the drugs are likely to still work uh, if they can skip, uh, you know, every other session. So that's how we've approached it from an immunotherapy standpoint. Uh, the other situation that I might just comment on briefly um, is the, you know, the space of the neoadjuvant setting. So treatment prior to a cystectomy with a systemic drug, be it chemotherapy or on a clinical trial, immunotherapy drugs in that neoadjuvant setting. Uh, for all of those patients, we've uh, adopted the practice of going forward with therapy. We consider that curative intent therapy, right? In a neoadjuvant setting and in, in the setting of drugs that you're receiving prior to a cystectomy, the goal there is cure. 
We are trying to cure mm -hmm. the patient of bladder cancer. And so that is paramount in our minds. And so we are, um, we are not withholding or delaying any therapies for patients in that neoadjuvant setting. Good to know. Dr. Main, uh, for patients that are maybe on bladder preservation with the combined chemo, surgery, and radiation, are you making any changes in your protocol based on other research that's been done that you can go shorter, go more radiation for a shorter period of time? Is there anything that's happening there? You're on mute, Omar. Can you unmute? There you go. Sorry. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it's a good question. Yeah, so we are a little bit. I think we're still sticking to the standard of care. And as, uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, we're taking the treatment of our um, you know, potentially curable patients who have aggressive disease very seriously. We're not trying to do anything that would compromise their outcomes. Uh, and so therefore, we stick to standard therapies. But as all of you will have known uh, just from watching the news, you know, there's a federal level response, a state level response, a municipal level response, and there's something similar going on in all of our medical societies, you know, from the AUA to the American Society of Radiation Oncology to the um, American Society of Clinical Oncology. These are all groups that have put out recommendations for how to approach treatments and how, how to uh, handle uh, patients during this time. Those get filtered through individual hospital systems like the Cleveland Clinic or Ohio State University of Chicago and down to individual hospitals within those systems. And, and I'll say that some of these decisions like the length of fractionation, which is the length of time a patient may be on radiotherapy, are made at that level based on resources, based on whether a unit is uh, able to treat patients who have a known exposure, for example. So answering in very general terms, I would say, one, one of the things we're trying to do, and again, this is adhering to guidelines, is uh, we're trying to use shorter courses of radiation within evidence-based guidelines. For example, 20 treatment regimen with concurrent chemotherapy for that patient that might be um, uh, eligible for bladder preservation for a trimodality therapy approach. And so we, we're sticking to more shorter regimens. That's something, frankly, that we would, would have tried to do even before this all started, but now we're, we're you know, it's more in our, um, in the front of our minds to kind of reduce exposure for patients. So I, it, it's a very good question. I have a handful of patients right now who are being treated in this way and getting shorter, uh, shorter overall length of treatment times. I think the number of touches in that way is not really a, a, as big of a risk factor for those patients as things like paying attention to their contacts within um, uh, the community, as well as things like their immunosuppression. I'll just tell you that at the Cleveland Clinic, we currently have, as of today, 150 COVID positive patients hospitalized within our system. About a third of those, third to a half at any time, are in the ICUs. Um, we have about 100 doctors or nurses, caregivers that have been diagnosed positive. There's a very small number of them that have been hospitalized. And as you might imagine, we pay very close attention to whether or not the caregivers cluster in any particular unit. You know, for example, are they all coming from uh, one unit of uh, where they're doing respiratory care for exposed patients, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I bring this up because at least at present, we're not really seeing that this clustering is happening. And so even for patients who are, or, or for caregivers who are in the hospital for a good, good um, part of their time, a lot of the spread we think that we're seeing and a lot of the patients we're seeing coming in have, uh, it's, it's really community exposure. And I'm not saying that they're not at risk by coming out. And as, as you all know, we have to be distancing. But we have, I feel like, done an effective job of minimizing people's exposure within the hospital. And so, okay. again, echoing the comments that have already been made, we are not taking a very a small risk, what we think is a small but serious risk of exposure to the virus and, and using that to trump the very real risk of a patient with an invasive or muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, and, and their treatment. And so... Um, that's, uh, that's kind of how we've approached that. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. It does. Thank you. And I think that as we process this and get to the other side, there'll be some really interesting research studies that are being done following how things have changed and whether we still need to go back to the old way of doing some of these things or if there were better ways of doing them. So, Dr. Hafren, what all do you see as far as, you know, when do you think it's okay 
for patients to not come into your practice, come into your office for treatment or surveillance. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, basically, it's very similar to what everyone else has presented, but basically low risk, AUA guideline, low risk pro, uh, bladder cancer, we're delaying uh, a month, um, but anyone with high risk bladder cancer, CIS, muscle invasive, T1 high grade, according to the AUA, American Urological Association, we're seeing and that we're having um, them come in for their cystoscopies. We're having them treated with BCG or intravesical therapy, whatever we're using. So we've been able to keep treating these patients. Again, like I've mentioned earlier, the only delay we've had is with our uh, ability for our hospitals to keep up, but that's, you know, we're at our peak now and that's um, starting to open up. But I think what's also important for, for patients and looking at the Chinese, initial Chinese data, is that cancer patients may be at increased risk for COVID. Um, it makes sense, they're, they're potentially immunocompromised. It's not a great study, but um, some initial signals we're seeing out of China, I think as important as, as the patient's urologist and, and taking care of them, is that they do what, what the, you know, the government, the CDC, and, and all major societies are recommending is social distancing. If they do come into the office, they need to be wearing a mask. Um, if they're sick, don't come in. Um, they need to wash their hands and do everything that the government's recommending because potentially they might be at increased risk. So I think a lot of times, you know, patients will minimize it or not hear the message or, or, or kind of blow it off. And I think as they're treating physician, we need to remind them. And if a, if a patient does show up that, you know, is, you know, minimizing the risk, um, that we need to reinforce that, that social distance is important, that need to be putting on a mask, hand washing, and all that, that everything that we're, the government is saying needs to be practiced, especially if you have bladder cancer. Great, thank you guys so much. This is really helpful. So we'll just go backwards this I, time, Dr. I, Hathren. Yes, sure, Dr. Lee, thing? go ahead. Yeah, I yeah, just want please. to say, although I mentioned that we were uh, still in a position at, at Ohio State where we were uh, going forth with cystectomies, for those uh, uh, patients living in uh, communities where the hospitals are not able to do those procedures, you know, there's been a fair amount of data over, you know, the past 10 to 15 years looking at delay in cystectomy. And for patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer, really delays up to three months weren't associated with worst outcomes. Now, uh, no one wants to wait three months but again, if someone is able to have their surgery within that time period, there's some comfort in knowing that their outcomes won't, may not be grossly different. Uh, and after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the delay, the, the risk of delay uh, at 10 to 12 weeks, you know, was, was not greater uh, uh, in patients uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy who, who then went on to cystectomy. So, uh, some small degree of comfort for some patients who are having to have some delay in their in their radical surgery. Absolutely, most patients can't sit peacefully knowing that the cancer is still there and they want to make some steps. They've already made a decision with you and their treatment team and they're ready to go. They've already got their mindset for this. So now if we can just sort of flip around a little bit and talk about what constitutes an urgent need for care, so maybe we'll go backwards and start with Dr. Hafrun. You know, what do you see as an urgent need for care when you really do need to get in, whether it's for a televisit, to just get things checked out, or to have people actually come into your office from that bladder cancer perspective? Well, and then what should they expect when they come into your office? Well, I think what we're doing a lot of is the televisits are widely available. So I know in my practice and, and in our large group practice of 50 urologists, if a patient has a question, you know, we are available. Um, we can jump on a, a, a FaceTime or a televisit pretty easily. And over the phone, it's pretty miraculous. And as we're, you know, we've been just doing this for a few weeks how much information you can get from you know, a televisit. So we can pre-screen them and see if there is an urgent matter that you know, significant blood in the urine or you know, significant urinary symptoms. And if we feel it's necessary, we'll bring them in. But we do you know, do the pre-screening, but we also, again, I think we gotta educate the, the, the patients because we see it quite frequently. They're not coming in with a mask on. 
Um, they're not, uh, you know, I, when I ask them about, you know, are, what are you doing? And I find out they're going to the store or they're doing other things. I say, you really got it. You're in the age group above 60 with cancer. They're at significant risk. And you really need to minimize your social contacts, really need to stay at home because unfortunately or fortunately, I see what's going on in the hospital and they need to, you know, these aren't, you know, these are real, you know, there, there is a significant impact on COVID in our area. And if you minimize your risk, you know, minimize your risk and do everything that's recommended, um, you know, you can make a big difference. So I think uh, getting back to your question, I think, you know, what we try to do is, is telescreen them, you know, we're developing all these new verbs and things, see if how urgent it is, and we can bring them in because reality is a lot of urologists, because our non-essential surgery has been reduced or and for us, it's been shut down, we're available, you know, and there's a lot of doctors, a lot of urologists that have extra time on their hands so we, we can offer our services to our patients that are concerned or have questions. Great, great. Dr. Main, what about radiation oncology? What is an urgent need for care for them to come in to see you? Well, I think it wouldn't be too dissimilar from the other specialties here. You know, I would say that the patients are experiencing a sudden and uh, a change in their symptoms. Uh, they should at minimum be evaluated quickly. Patients shouldn't delay there. And I'd say the things that would warrant uh, coming in to be seen, you know, I generally see patients with muscle invasive disease, but things like uh, bleeding, new onset um, blood in the urine would be uh, an important one, uh, blood, blood in the stool, uh, other kind of new intractable pain. Uh, I'd want to hear about that right away. And there's going to be those patients in that group that can be managed with distance health and there's going to be a good fraction of them that need to be seen and shouldn't delay their their care but i would say the majority of my patients um, are not being seen for urgent or emergent reasons you know these are more scheduled visits and can be handled in a more controlled way to dr o'donnell there are a number of adverse events that are linked to both chemotherapy you know, side effects and then the adverse events relating to immunotherapy. When is it urgent, say, that somebody needs to go right to an emergency department or when should they wait and, you know, when do they need to just make an urgent appointment for you to come into your practice? Yeah, I mean, that's a complicated question and I'm not sure the answer is all that different from, you know, if we weren't in the COVID situation. Right, and you need to you need to talk to your individual treatment team. You know your nurse, your doctor, who knows you really well. Uh, one of the you know factors that's going to be in their mind is you know are your symptoms potentially related related to COVID? Are they related to your disease? Are they related to the treatment we're giving you? And that's very individualized, right? That takes knowing what treatment you're on, what's the timing of that cycle that you're on. Are you at a point where your immune system is likely to be at a low point from chemotherapy? Uh, you know, one point I'll make regarding immunotherapy, right, is one of the rare but serious toxicities of immunotherapy, some immunotherapies, is lung in inflammation, which can look very much like what COVID can present as. And so your doctor needs to have that in mind, knowing that you're on a treatment that could potentially cause a lung toxicity and not just have some, you know, uh, ER physician not be aware of that and, and, you know, think that this is all an infectious cause. So, it's a really complicated question that you ask, and it really involves, you know, just speaking with your doctor and telling them what's going on. Your doctor will know how to triage that correctly. Uh, the other point I'll make here, I think the other important message is that, and it echoes what some of the other docs here have said, is that, you know, if you're a new patient with a new diagnosis, um, don't delay, right? We can do a lot from a video or telehealth new patient visit. We are seeing new patients virtually without having to see you uh, you know, in person in the clinic right now, and oftentimes that will allow us to start lining up some of the things that we'll need when we can start treating you. For example, you know, we can do a lot with look, reviewing your pathology or the scans that you've had and reviewing those reports and those tissues without having you physically at the medical center. And some of my patients, I'll even initiate PDL1 testing, for example, which, you know, is something that we want to get sent off and wait for the result, and we can do all that from a virtual new patient visit. Even practical things like 
you know, I, I'm in Chicago and we're a high population density center, but if my patient actually lives out in the suburbs, I can send them to get a CAT scan close to home at their local hospital where the COVID numbers are actually lower. And it's probably safer to do, the, do that, get the scan close to home rather than ha them having coming to the big medical center where most of these patients are and getting the CAT scan there. So practical things that can be lined up um, you know, from that first telehealth visit um, that allow us to initiate a lot of the steps that we're gonna need to undertake anyway to treat a new patient. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you guys so much. Dr. Lee, do you have anything to kind of wrap up this urgent need? When is it urgent in your mind? Yeah, I mean, on, on the Dr. Haffron summarized, and as did others, that, you know, for us, it's uh, gross hematuria, bloody urine, uh, urinary obstruction, where someone's having trouble voiding, uh, pain, particularly kidney pain or flank pain. Those are all uh, signs that are really going to catch our attention and know that we need to see someone in person. Uh, the second half of your question is, you know, what should patients and families expect? Um, one, and uh, some others may have mentioned it, but at the James Cancer Hospital and across our center, you know, we've had to restrict the number of visitors coming in with patients. Uh, in the emergency room, there are no uh, uh, visitors allowed with the patient. If someone's having a procedure, uh, they can come in for the procedure and for a major procedure one day after. So there's uh, that to know and expect. Uh, expect universal masking. Uh, that the healthcare workers will have masks on and in the inpatient unit, they'll have protective eyewear on so people look a little bit differently. Um, it, it can be isolating because you don't have your family and friends around you um, and you can't always physically see your nurses and doctors the way you're used to seeing them. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the James, we've tried hard to, uh, at this point, because of the, the, the level of, of COVID positive patients we've had in the hospital, we've restricted any COVID-19 positive patients from being in the cancer hospital because of the number of immunosuppressed, immunocompromised patients that are, are actually in the hospital. So you can expect that you can't move freely from building to building because we're trying to uh, have those restrictions. So I think uh, that's what we're doing at the James, uh, but I'm sure that some of those things are going on at other hospitals too. So the visits are a bit restrictive, a little bit more isolating, unfortunately. Sure, thank you. Thank you all so much. So. How do you think things will evolve over the next few weeks as we learn more about COVID-19 and bladder cancer patients? You've already mentioned that, you know, hopefully telemedicine won't go away when this is all over. Um, but are you seeing anything that you think is going to improve bladder cancer care? Um, or do we know anything that we're beginning to see patterns in bladder cancer patients who might be COVID positive? Dr. Lee? Well, you know, I think uh, the telehealth is certainly the, the, the biggest impact, I think, for all of us that I think will still be here to stay when this is, this is over. And as I uh, have looked at my practice, which is a very heavily, you know, a, a practice that heavily relies on cystoscopy, I'm thinking more about the days when there was discussions around virtual cystoscopy. Uh, will that become something that will develop again or reemerge again? Uh, I'm thinking about uh, our surveillance strategies, to be honest with you, will we think more about relaxing those or changing how we see patients? Um, you know, we, we talked about imaging, but ra radiology departments around the country have also been very restrictive of what imaging they will do. Uh, so it may, again, have us thinking about outcomes after this and, uh, and, and what, our, uh, what our surveillance program looks like. So I, I suspect there will be some changes and some research coming out of this over you know, the coming months. We hope that uh, for many of these very heavy hit areas in the country, they're already reaching the peak of their surge, we hope. And uh, some of us, uh, other states are behind a week or two. But uh, my hope is that we'll be seeing things, uh, hopefully the, the backside of the curves or the downward trends of these curves uh, with a decreasing number of COVID-19 patients over the next several weeks into May. And hopefully by the end of May or June, we'll be able to, uh, at least with some proportion of patients or highly prioritized patients, begin to get folks back in for their essential surgeries. So I think that's going to be emerging over the coming, you know, six weeks or so. Or so. Thank you, Dr. Lee.
I think you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the virtual cystectomy? I know you mentioned that, and that was one of the questions that just came in. So what is a virtual cystectomy? Actually, it was virtual cystoscopy. Um, oh, okay, gotcha. But, but just as um, people may have heard of patients swallowing a small camera pill uh, and people being able to track actually the inner part of the colon uh, or the small intestine, through uh, the, the assistance of these really teeny cameras that will then go through the intestinal tract. Uh, several years ago, maybe three to five years ago, there was some interest in virtual cystoscopy, putting this kind of pellet into the bladder and then being able to use that to look at the inside of the bladder. Um, you know, I think, I think things like that uh, will become of a, a, a greater interest when we're doing a lot of our uh, surveillance or care or, or follow up uh, remotely. Uh, so I think, you know, um, you know, necessity or what, what is it? Invention is the necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> so you're muted, Stephanie. We can't hear you. Thank you. A question for all of you that if people have had things postponed, maybe a surgery being postponed or it's just a just, yeah cystoscopy postponed, how are you going to decide who gets in first when all of this lightens up and you get to get back to regular practice? How are you going to prioritize that? Is it whoever was out the longest, who wasn't able to get care the longest? How are you going to rank that? I think for us, Stephanie, what we, you know, we, we fortunately have risk categories um, from the American Urological Association and the European Urology Association. So the way we look at it is uh, treating the patients with the highest risk that we get back in. But reality is, even though we're we're in the throes at the peak of of, of our COVID, um, we're patients. You know, we're, the delays are minimal. There is some delay, so I think we've lost some convenience, which has been made up by telehealth. But we're still pretty much able to treat the patients that need to be treated. So I think a lot of it is just reassuring patients that a week or two delay or a month delay is really not gonna make a huge impact. And as we've heard from other centers, even in Chicago where they're being hit pretty hard, they're still able to maintain chemotherapy and high intensity tra uh, treatment. So we look at it based on risk. You know, it, it's not so much the delay, it's, it's the risk and patients that need to be treated will be treated. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lee, did you have something to add? Uh, I was going to say, uh, I agree with that completely. I think it's just risk stratification, but uh, a lot of the centers and ours, for example, has used the electronic health record uh, EPIC to create patient dashboards so that as we're scheduling patients and getting patients uh, in line, so to speak, we can uh, put markers of prioritization on, uh, for that particular patient so that when all of this is, you know, uh, hopefully turning the corner, we'll know which patients really need to uh, float to the top uh, and really be seen as quickly as possible. And those will be the highest risk patients as Dr. Hafren mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, and then you mentioned this idea of pre-visit testing, maybe going into your community center to have scans done and then coming into the larger hospitals to come in for your actual patient visits with your doctor. So we, we're gonna, probably see more of that, do you think, as we go along, helping to keep people out of the largely populated medical centers? Do you think that's a trend that we're going to see continue? Yeah, I think I so. what, what we're trying to do is keep patients out of the emergency rooms. We're trying to keep them out of the hospitals. And uh, what's interesting, you know, aside from what's been discussed, is how well patients have stayed away from the hospitals. So our hospital, we're not seeing a lot of our routine consults, the patient with a recent stroke, a recent heart attack, or you know, even the stone disease that what, you know, as urologists we see, a lot of patients are staying away from the hospital, you know, whether it's, mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting and it'll be, we'll know after time is where are these patients, what's going on? You know, because the disease, the heart attacks, the strokes are still still happening, 
but why aren't they coming to the emergency room? But that's a side note, but I think the key and you know, is keeping the patients out of the hospital, keeping them out of the emergency room. And fortunately with telehealth, we can screen a lot of that and prevent that and move them to you know, an imaging center away from a major medical center, um, bring them into the office, which at this point is much safer than going to uh, a, a large COVID hospital. So um, I think what the key is, is, is for patients is to communicate with the doctor. Call your doctor, tell your doctor, you know, we're available. And uh, a lot of this can, stress or anxiety can be eliminated. I'm going to combine a set of questions here. They're really looking at patients who might have had COVID-19 or currently have COVID-19 and they need to come in. I know you've alluded to this a little bit, but some of your institutions have special floors or some are divided up so that COVID patients go in one direction. Are they still seeing you as their primary caregiver or are they seeing another doctor because they also have COVID? What's the situation as they get in there? You know, at the James, uh, like I said, the James Cancer Hospital, we've uh, been able to keep all known COVID-19 uh, COVID positive patients outside of the building. Um, but, uh, and we've actually restricted specific uh, units in the hospital for patients that we know are positive or being ruled out. Um, so they would still see a urologist if they had a urologic condition, uh, but certainly their primary management right now is by one of the uh, hospitalists or intensivists as needed. Um, now with a, a larger volume of patients or a surge setting, uh, that might change. And we might see that um, there's a broader use of the team approach where a very experienced intensivist might work with um, surgical specialists and medical specialists to help care for the population uh, and just get the patients taken care of. So it's, it's certainly, you know, for those patients, uh, when the hospital is full, they might have a, a team, more of a team-based approach. Mm -hmm. Well, we're That's coming tough. up on the... Yeah, on the hour, I just want to open it up and see if you all had any other comments that you would like to make. Well, Stephanie, one thing I would just say is that even though we talked about how this might evolve over the next couple of weeks, uh, months, I, you know, I feel like there's going to be some things here that uh, are going to evolve over a much slower period. We, we just don't know. We're in the early days of things and you know there's been some nice developments some there appears to be some flattening of the curves we're relaxing some of the stratification that we were doing in terms of tiering the most urgent patients and those are all uh good trends but you know i would just uh, caution folks to um you know, pay close attention be in touch with your providers this is evolving over a short period of time but i suspect that we're going to have uh guidelines and changes and ramifications from this that probably extend out for quite a period of time. And we don't know that there won't be a second wave of this uh, down the road here. So um, I, I just think this is an important conversation to keep going. I, I thought I'd just add that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody I'll else? I'll just add that, uh, you know, one of the things that we know is true of bladder cancer before, even before COVID is that a delay in diagnosis really puts patients in a bad situation to potentially be cured of their disease. So, you know, that first sign of hematuria, you know, when that patient, for whatever reason, delays getting to a urologist. And so I'm hoping that, you know, this, what we've talked about with this idea of telehealth being here to stay could actually decrease some of the disparities that we've seen in patients, you know, getting that proper diagnosis of bladder cancer, even after all this is over. I think it's a really important message for patients, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, that might be diagnosed with bladder cancer in the future. Any other last comments? I'd like to steer everybody to our webpage. If you're looking for additional information, we've posted a number of frequently asked questions about bladder cancer and COVID-19. So if you check our webpage regularly, you'll see any updates as we provide them. So again, bcan.org forward slash COVID-19-FAQ. 
And I'd like to thank you all so much for a wonderful program, very informative. The recording will be available for participants. You will be receiving a short survey. Please take a moment and let us know your thoughts about today's program. I'd like to thank you all again so much for joining us from all over the mid-central states and sharing your expertise with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. You too. You too.